this uh, plenary session. I'm Colin Drummond. I'm the Professor of Addiction Psychiatry at King's College London. And I'm also uh, the President of the European Federation of Addiction Societies. And we're very proud to uh, have co-organized this session this morning on, on alcohol research. Uh, I'm going to say very little because I want you to hear from our excellent speakers. And I'd like to first introduce uh, Pia Michaela, who's a research professor at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare in Helsinki, Finland. And she's going to talk about a social inequalities viewpoint to reducing alcohol-related harm. Please welcome Pia. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here today, and I thank the organizers for uh, having invited me to uh, talk here um, uh, about this uh, uh, topic of social ine inequities in um, alcohol-related harm. Um, and the main point in my talk will be not so much to present completely new things, but rather to review where we are in the field and um, to try to give a holistic uh, view about this issue. Um, there are no conflicts of interest to uh, report. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is first to um, shortly address why we are still interested in alcohol and why we are interested in inequalities between population groups and not just individuals. Um, and then what the between and within country inequalities in alcohol-related harm look like, um, what explains these differences, and then uh, what impl implications for prevention and intervention uh, this all has. And this is mainly for those in the audience who do not work with alcohol. Um, why are we still interested in alcohol, um, even if it's old news, and there are so many more uh, fresh, uh, new, uh, emerging issues. And it's, of course, because uh, the harmful alcohol use um, causes such a big burden um, on our societies. Um, it causes 3 million deaths annually and the loss of um, 130 million disability-adjusted life years globally. It's the seventh most important risk fac factor for mortality overall, and uh, it increases the risk of wide range of outcomes, including those shown on the slide. And the burden um, is related to especially two aspects of alcohol use, the volume of drinking, which is the total amount of alcohol that we uh, consume, and then the patterns of drinking, especially heavy episodic drinking. And alcohol use is, of course, a necessary cause of all alcohol-related outcomes and um, harms. But it's not the only one. Everyone with a similar volume of consumption and a similar pattern of drinking will not have the same burden from their alcohol use. <coughs> there are society-level factors and there are individual-level factors that will cause quite substantial differences in uh, people's vulnerability to the effects of alcohol. And in this talk, I will talk especially about the socioeconomic um, aspects that uh, cause uh, differences in this vulnerability and at the society level about the economic development of societies. So the burden from alcohol doesn't fall uh, evenly across individuals and across societies. Um, for example, alcohol is the leading risk factor among people aged under 50, even if the absolute burden will be higher uh, beyond that age. And the burden is, uh, of course, much higher among men than it is among women. And it falls hardest on less developed societies, and also it falls hardest on the poor and vulnerable individuals in our, 
um, our societies. Here's a good illustration by the WHO um, about how the share that alcohol-related mortality makes of all um, mortality, how that changes by age. And you can see that th and the different lines are different regions of the world. And you can see that the share of alcohol-related uh, deaths is uh, the biggest below um, age uh, 40. Uh, 49, um, and even if the burden is in absolute terms greater in um, less developed societies, um, in um, as a proportion, um, it's the greatest in Europe, where we have been able to reduce to a minimum um, those deaths that come from natural causes, cancers, etc. Then to this quest question, why should we look at groups and not just individuals? Um, I refer to the United Nations Social Development Goals. Um, there's a central common principle for all these goals, uh, which is uh, leave no one behind. And goal 10 is expressly about reducing inequality within and among countries. Uh, and goal three, the health goal, is um, that we should ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all in all ages. Also, the WHO European um, program of work um, has the same principle. Um, and it calls for action to address the um, persistent health inequalities in and between countries across the WHO Europe's work. Um, with regard to the between country differences, um, it uh, tends to be so that uh, development and higher income countries leads to more um, drinkers and higher consumption. And these differences have been observed to be about twofold between the uh, highest and poorest quartile of countries. And this can be seen in both uh, cross-sectional comparison of countries and also um, uh, in time when less developed countries have become more developed. Um, so the lower income countries have or they experience more harm for each liter of alcohol that is consumed in them. Um, and these differences are from three to four fold. Um, so it's clear that the population of poor countries is more vulnerable to the effects of uh, risky drinking. Um, Alcohol-related outcomes have been called diseases of affluence. And without strong public health countermeasures, um, the economic development of poor countries will lead to more alcohol consumption and harms. And Here's just a couple of pictures to remind us that the alcohol industry is doing their best to ensure that this connection is there, that with economic development there will be more, more drinking and more harm. Let's then move on to within country inequalities. And a short note first on the concepts. Health inequality, uh, health disparities, health inequities, they have varying definitions and different experts use them in different ways. But the common theme to all of them is that uh, they refer to systemat systematic differences in health between groups. And especially with inequity, uh, there um, is the idea that uh, the differences are considered avoidable and unfair and unjust. I tend to use them quite interchangeably. And what are the groups that um, researchers and policymakers uh, think about? Of course, things like gender and age and ethnicity, but um, social economic groups are a very central um, key differentiation as well. 
whether they be measured by education or occupational and employment status or income, wealth or social class. Um, stigma and marginalization are closely related terms and concepts, um, especially when they are connected to alcoholism or addiction or alcohol dependence. Um, they are, yeah, they are closely linked, but uh, still separate. So, social inequality in alcohol-related harm is very high. Um, there are up to five-fold differences in alcohol-related mortality uh, between lower and higher socioeconomic groups. Um, there are, of course, um, health inequalities for all cause mortality and for many other uh, causes of death, but uh, they tend to be higher for alcohol-related mortality. Um, for alcohol-related mortality, the difference is from 1.5 to two times higher than for all cause mortality. And for some European countries, also in Finland where I come from, <coughs> alcohol-related conditions play an important role in generating inequalities in uh, life expectancy. There's a paradox in these differences, uh, the so-called alcohol harm paradox. Um, namely, inequality in alcohol-related harm is only partially explained by drinking. Um, according to this uh, review by Charlotte Probst, who may be here to today, um, up to 27% of uh, these differences could be explained by alcohol use. And in that case, or then it was mostly by heavy episodic drinking. So more than 70% remains to be explained by something else. Um, and it so, uh, tends to be so that people with higher status um, are less often abstainers and they drink more frequently. Um, with respect to heavy drinking, um, among women in many countries, uh, or actually most, at least European countries, it tends to be so that women with higher status also drink more often heavily. Uh, whereas for men, the differences uh, differ from country to country, but in any case, they tend to be smaller. In, uh, the differences in heavy drinking tend to be much smaller than they are for alcohol-related mortality. And this means that the most disadvantaged people consistently suffer disproportionately um, uh, or disproportionate risks of um, their drinking. Um, and therefore, uh, also here it's the case that they uh, experience more harm for each liter of alcohol that they consume compared to people who are uh, better off. Then the question of what causes this alcohol harm paradox. And there are lots of hypotheses. There is not yet so much evidence, and, and the evidence is coming in um, still today. I, I learned yesterday in a session that, um, uh, about new, new uh, results on this. Um, but any case, in any case, it's clear that the level of exposure, the drinking, is an insufficient explanation, and clearly then, the vulnerability to the effects of alcohol has to play a key role. And this vulnerability may be due to individual susceptibility. Um, a lot of research has concentrated on um, various lifestyle factors and health behaviors and um, to the fact that they may accumulate and they may interact with each other uh, to cause more harm. And indeed, this seems to be one, one of the explanations. Also, adversities, um, adversities throughout the life force um, has to be uh, one key, uh, or could be one key explanation. There, there's not so much um, results on that yet. Uh, there are also hypotheses about uh, possible genetic, um, or possible differences in genetic makeup, but no results. Um, and the vulnerability could also be due to contextual and environmental factors, such as uh, social support or the drinking context. 
different, uh, differences in uh, treatment and healthcare uh, could also be one factor at play. Um, and then, in, at least in some cases, it may be the case that reverse causation explains some part of the differences. And that means that um, when alcohol problems develop, um, that can lead to marginalization and stigma and downward drift. But this is expected to have an impact, especially on the income differences, because income changes more easily with alcohol problems than does, for example, uh, ed education, which you have <laughs> had once you have had received it. Um, and there could also be methodological explanations. They have not been completely ruled out either. But what's m my take home message from this is that um, there are complex causes uh, with a multitude of factors at play, um, which are intertwined and entangled. Um, and how then can we reduce these inequities in alcohol-related harm? Of course, there's, there's <laughs> uncertainty to this answer because we don't fully understand the causes. Then we do not, cannot uh, fully know what's, what, or what's going to work for them. Um, again, tackling just drinking alone would not be sufficient. Um, but I think that um, if we, um, uh, we, we should be able to move towards greater, in, um, greater equity if uh, we manage to selectively improve the health of the uh, disadvantaged. Um, I think there's quite general agreement that in order for policies and interventions to be effective, uh, they must use a comprehensive approach uh, to reducing alcohol-related harm and related inequalities. And we should look at alcohol use in the context of a broad network, network of factors, which is here depicted in the outer circle. Um, and if we want to reduce alcohol-related in, uh, inequalities, um, we cannot only concentrate on the individual's bad behavior, even if the alcohol industry would wish us to do so, um, but we have to look at the social determinants of that behavior. This is a bit of the same point uh, from another angle. Um, so there's a need to address the determinants of alcohol-related harm and, and the equalities at various levels and stages. So for example, in prevention and screening, uh, we should make sure that no one is left behind. And perhaps we might examine possibilities of uh, positive um, discrimination, um, of targeting the efforts to people who do not have um, the social and economic safety nets of their own, but need more support from the society. Uh, we need to address the root causes and social determinants, the upstream factors like poverty and education. Um, and we need to make sure that the treatment systems um, provide accessible and appropriate services to all so that the consequences and symptoms of alcohol-related problems um, can be um, uh, tackled, the, the downstream factors. And also I... Um, I think it's important that the services try to reduce um, intergenerational transmission of alcohol-related problems. Um, it's also important to ensure that our social environment um, supports healthy choices. There was a whole interesting session yesterday about this theme. Um, among the upstream factors that are very important are commercial and pot political determinants of health. And um, in, the, um, uh, in, in the alcohol case, um, I think alcohol control policies are very important. Um, alcohol affordability and uh, the prices of alcohol um, are likely to be quite um, effective uh, tools in reducing alcohol-related inequities. Although I think in yesterday's session, 
um, there was a review that puts a new question mark here, but, um, but we'll learn uh, more and more every year. Um, also, I think uh, it's likely that the um, uh, tools of alcohol availability and outlet density um, that are effective to reduce alcohol-related harm, that they might be um, also effective in reducing inequities, but we do need more uh, research on that still. Um, and there has been some evidence um, about um, neighborhood uh, planning and zoning and licensing that they might help, especially if they are targeted to um, uh, deprived neighborhoods or perhaps also if they are uh, targeted to, for example, young people without any education or um, little education. Um, uh, the list of uh, non-efficient um, policies uh, in reducing the disparities includes educational efforts and information campaigns, which are more likely to be picked up by the better edu educated. And then as to the question of how to avoid increasing rates of harms that come with economic de development, um, the same tool set, the use of efficient policies, the WHO safer policies is likely one um, important thing. Um, pricing policies, alcohol availability, alcohol, uh, banning alcohol ad advertising, uh, drink driving countermeasures and brief interventions. But in addition to that, um, it would be important to negotiate the trade agreements so that they would allow um, governments to act to reduce alcohol-related harm with these uh, efficient policies. And it, ideally, there would be a public health treaty um, similar to the uh, framework convention on tobacco control, which would make it clear that alcohol is not an ordinary commodity. And last, um, there's a piece of evidence from Finland uh, where, uh, or about what happened to social inequities in alcohol-related mortality when there was were major changes in alcohol aff affordability. Um, in the first period, or um, towards the beginning of the 2000, uh, the part where you can, which is marked in red, alcohol affordability in Finland increased strongly, uh, especially in 2004, when the alcohol taxes were reduced by uh, one third, because Estonia was joining um, European Union and, and uh, uh, travelers could bring uh, lots of cheap alcohol across the borders. And um, also it was good, good economic time. Uh, then after 2008, the economy got worse, uh, but also uh, there were seven different smaller alcohol tax raises, uh, so that alcohol became more expensive for people to buy. Um, and that's marked on green. And in addition to this, in 2018, the availability of strong beer and alcohol pops increased. So here you can see what happened to alcohol-related mortality overall. Um, you can see that when al alcohol became cheaper, alcohol-related mortality increased. And then when alcohol became more expensive, alcohol-related mortality decreased. And actually this figure doesn't perhaps give you the right um, understanding of the scale of that change, because in working age population, alcohol-related mortality decreased by one third in this period. Th that was really um, something. But then let's look at what happened by income. These are income quintiles for men. And first of all, you can notice that um, there are really big differences between the income groups, that the level is by far the highest among those who are the poorest. But then you can also see that um, this, the fact that alcohol became cheaper was, had really devastating effects on the poorest uh, uh, part of the population. Uh, Alcohol-related mortality increased increased really strongly. But the good news is that then after um, alcohol taxes were raised several times, it turned that uh, bad uh, development. And um, uh, this is why, uh, a key reason to why the 
overall alcohol-related mortality has uh, decreased. If we want to reduce harms, it's most effective if we manage to work with the people who have the most harms. Um, some take-home messages. Social inequities in alcohol-related burden is great both within and between countries. And there's the alcohol harm paradox. It's not only the drinking causing these um, inequities, but there are a multitude of complex intertwined uh, factors at play. And we must use effective policies and interventions and comprehensive, a comprehensive approach to reduce inequality. Um, and I leave you with these uh, references. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Pia, for that very comprehensive talk. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to have trouble actually seeing hands up, but um, do we have any questions from the audience, please? not a room that is very inviting <laughs> to <laughs> discussion. There's one. So there's a hand waving up, up there. There we go. Franca Beccaria from Italy. Thank you, Pia, for this wonderful, uh, very interesting presentation. I I'm really happy that you underlined the role of inequ social inequalities, but at the, at the end I wonder why uh, you focus most of uh, availability policy while the last uh, graph that uh, you show show clearly that we, ha we should work more on uh, uh, general inequ inequity <laughs> In, uh, from uh, uh, talking about unemployment, the social condition, and so on. Because otherwise, it seems to me a little bit paternalistic uh, solution to uh, reduce uh, only the accessibility to alcohol. Thank you. Thanks, Franca. I hope I made the point that we have to use a comprehensive set of different types of measures. but. Um, it's for, for a politician, it's quite a lot simpler to make a law that raises alcohol taxes, which has an immediate impact, than to try to... They, they do their best to reduce unemployment, um, I'm sure, but it's, it's a much more difficult thing to do. So we should, of course, aim to uh, work on these uh, uh, more general issues, um, reducing social I inequities, but... Uh, at the same time, um, I think we can uh, use these uh, more immediate factors. Thank you very much I, um, for an excellent talk. Thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to move on to our next speaker this morning, who is uh, Professor Jim McCambridge, uh, my colleague from the University of York, where he's Chair of Addictive Behaviour and Public Health uh, in the UK. And Jim is, is an expert on brief interventions and also an expert on the role of the alcohol industry. So he's going to knit these things together uh, in, a, in a very clever way, I'm sure, uh, to talk about can brief interventions ever really take on the alcohol industry and win? Jim. Thank you, Colin. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare, and I have funding from these three bodies. And this is not a sole authored talk. Many people have been involved in the research that underpins this talk and the shaping of the ideas in it. And some of them, only some of them, are identified in this slide, and I'm not going to <laughs> try and go through the list. Uh, the talk is structured in a very straightforward way. There are three parts. There roughly of equal duration. I'm going to take you through a very brief history of brief interventions. 
I'm going to invite you to think about the nature of the challenge posed by the alcohol industry and alcohol marketing in particular. In particular. And then I'm going to invite you to think differently about what brief interventions are and can be and how they might be different in the future. So the story of brief interventions starts around 40 years ago uh, with the rise of the, the then new, new public health ideas, the Ottawa Charter and, and health promotion. And in the early 1980s, WHO played an important role in bringing together researchers across the world in, in a, a major research program. And this did work including develop the audit screening tool and undertake an international trial in 10 countries uh, that identified that it was possible to have conversations with people about their drinking in ways which led them later to reduce it. And that program took a few years to get going as you know, new paradigms do. And by 1986, when this first review was published, the key setting identified in the program primary health care uh, had no trials yet, uh, although some trials had been undertaken in other settings. And a few years ago, John Cunningham and I did a review of the history of ideas involved in the building of this evidence base. And in it, we captured uh, a golden age roughly between the publication of that review in 1985, 1986, and the publication of a later review by Thomas Bien and colleagues in 1993. And in that, we concluded that a truly new paradigm had been forged. Now, the Bien and colleagues review identified a need to study a range of different issues to further develop the literature, including those that are identified on this slide. And although there have been studies on each of these uh, objects, I think it's true to say that those research questions remain unanswered. So there are important uncertainties about brief interventions where knowledge has not advanced over the course of the last 30 years. And we, we concluded that brief interventions had been more focused on making and taking opportunities for interventions than well-specified activities with distinct characteristics. So what happened? What, what, what might explain why the literature did not develop uh, after that time? Well, partly I think it's down to the interventions themselves that were evaluated within the, brief, within the original brief intervention trial and the theoretical foundations of those interventions. So firstly, we had advice, which was conceptualized as social influence. And at the time, in the 1980s, the idea was here, firm advice to modify unhealthy drinking would be sufficient to motivate patients to modify their drinking. And then also within the trial, counseling was evaluated and found to be not superior to advice. And the idea with counseling was that behavioral techniques, psychology would be added to advice to hopefully boost the effects of it. That did not work in that trial nor subsequently. And then the major development in the literature since that time was the development of motivational interviewing as the predominant counsel counseling style within the alcohol field. Now, not long after uh, that time, there began to be voices of concern within the brief intervention movement about the project to translate what seemed promising research findings into real gains in routine practice in primary health care and elsewhere. So one of the leading figures within the field, Nick Heather, published a series of papers around about 25 years ago, which attested to the fact that all was not well within the field of brief interventions if the aspiration was to make a difference to people's health. And the, that concern about implementation has continued and many efforts have been uh, directed to improve implementation over a number of decades and advances have been made, but fundamental problems remain. And so that situation has given rise to a conclusion, particularly among the, among the leaders of the brief intervention field itself, that a change is needed. We can't go on persisting 
with the 1980s version of what a brief intervention is. So here's one paper from some leading authors who identify the need for a paradigm shift. Here's another, you know, which, which draws similar conclusions, a different group of authors with the honorable exception of Tony Gual. And here's a paper that I published with the late Rich Sates, uh, which, which again uh, suggests what we need to do is rethink what brief interventions are trying to do. And in this study, we particularly examined the evidence base in general practice where the literature had been most extensively developed. And our summary of the first era of brief interventions goes something like this. The limitations of the research literature have received too little attention. Um, there's a large body of existing evidence. There are many, many hundreds of trials in different settings. But despite the size of that uh, uh, body of evidence, we argue that it's best interpreted as demonstrating efficacy, that brief interventions can work at some times in some circumstances and should not be interpreted as effectiveness evidence that one can have confidence that if you implement a brief intervention program that's been studied in research, that will translate into real health gains in the population being served. And this perennial question of implementation is challenging for many, many reasons. Into the 21st century then, we had a new kid on the block, and that was the internet and the development of digital interventions that targeted drinking. And here's a review from a few years ago. And there are other reviews and they draw similar conclusions that, you know, that bear quite a striking resemblance to the conclusions that were drawn from the golden age of brief interventions. There's much promise in these types of interventions. But at the same time, you see some characteristics of this more recently emerging literature that appear to directly mirror the characteristics of the older literature. And that is some ambiguity about whether studies should be interpreted as providing evidence of effectiveness or efficacy. In this literature, a near exclusive reliance on self-reported behavioral outcomes to determine whether interventions are effective or not. And in this review and in other similar reviews, possible problems with self-report self are not routinely regarded within risk of bias assessments. Then we see a pattern which exists in almost every intervention literature that, that you look at that effects, our, our, our effect sizes are larger in smaller trials. And interestingly in this literature, they appear to be larger than for face-to-face -face interventions. And then finally, um, there are many uncertainties about the content of this literature in the form of unexplained heterogeneity in meta-analytic estimates of effects. But it is striking that even with all of the things that we don't understand within these reviews about this literature, that the largest trials within this literature show different findings than smaller trials. The largest, the largest trials show interventions are not effective or not efficacious rather than efficacious. So speaking only of face-to-face -face interventions, Nick Heather, uh, around 10 years ago, posed the question, if we were to have brief interventions implemented as well as possible, could they be by themselves make a difference to population health? And by that time, Nick had concluded that they could not. Could not. Now, make note of the separation or the dislocation of brief interventions from wider alcohol policy measures in that assessment. Okay, so that's the, the end of the first third of the talk. In the second third, I'm going to invite you to step back a bit and think about what brief, in, brief interventions are trying to do. So these are conversations which invite people to think about the drinking, to reflect upon it in ways which might benefit their health. And this is how one person thought about the messages that society was sending about alcohol as they wandered through a supermarket. Being bombarded with encouragement to drink more alcohol uh, in the form of alcohol marketing and then arriving at a pharmacy and seeing some relatively impotent health promotion information suggesting the opposite. And this left this person confused. And what I'd suggest is important to consider in relation to alcohol marketing is its effects begin very early in life. 
children are exposed to alcohol marketing and are very familiar with alcohol, alcohol brands from a very, a very early age. So norms that promote drinking and heavy drinking are established early. Uh, David Courtright, in his recent book, has gone as far as to suggest that big business has become so adept at targeting the pleasure centers of the brain that this could be considered a defining feature of our age, limbic capitalism, he calls it. And then those, those of you who are British television viewers will be familiar with this uh, character, those who are not may see a stereotypical image of an alcohol problem drinker. Uh, and I, I pose this image partly to reflect on the fact that there isn't any agreed view within the research community about what an alcohol problem is. There isn't a construct which we are uh, allied behind and there's certainly no agreement about how you could measure whatever this thing is. And I think that's really important because without any messages coming from the research community, the general public are left with this idea of what an alcohol problem looks like. So if your drinking doesn't look like this, therefore it's not problematic, why would you need a brief intervention or any other kind of intervention? A few years ago, Gerda Reef uh, stated that the focus on the flawed individual consumer downplays the role of big business in producing excess and the role of governments and regulators in creating the political conditions for them to do so. And this is a problem that is a neoliberal framing of the ind individual responsibility for alcohol harms uh, that applies also to other objects which are important in public health. So in obesity, for example, this framing of individual responsibility has been identified as important to get beyond. And about 10 years ago, Robin Room said something very, very similar. If you put everything all of the thinking about alcohol problems at the individual level, well, that suits one party in particular, and that is the alcohol industry. And that, uh, this neoliberal framing of individual responsibility may be particularly potent and particularly problematic where alcohol and other addictive commodities are concerned. Now, we often talk about the alcohol industry as if it were an entity that was widely understood and I'm going to suggest to you that there are limits to the extent to which that phrase is helpful. So it's, it's not helpful to think that the guy down the road who, who owns a pub is the same as the big company, you know, in the boardrooms of which the health and well-being of uh, people within, you know, within whole continents across the world uh, depend. And so the most important part of the alcohol industry for public health to pay attention to are the largest companies, which are among the most profitable companies in any sector. And these are the 13 member companies of the IARD. Now, 30 to 40 years ago, when brief interventions were beginning, these were all nationally operating companies. Now they're all glo globally operating companies. They operate in at least two regions across the world. And then just to... Um, to take one example, uh, they operate also nationally in many, many countries. And we did a study recently where we were looking at expenditure on lobbying. So in the US, if you begin to add up the figures in, this, in the second column here, you will quickly arrive at a figure above $20 million. So this is lobbying expenditure in one year for federal level lobbying. Most alcohol policy measures in the US are enacted at the state level, so that's not included, and international lobbying based in the US, such as the IRD, is also not included. And then if you look further about what these big companies do, to the extent that there is product innovation, what you find is that the innovations pay very close attention to the dose of alcohol within the product. ABV. So this is Heineken's version of something called a spear that com combines beer and spirits. And if, if that looks a bit familiar, manipulation of the dose, that's because this is something we know all too well from other sectors. Uh, so the tobacco company pioneered, uh, the tobacco company Philip Morris pioneered the manipulation of dose in terms of the free basing of nicotine within cigarettes that it, its competitors later copied. 
And if, if you begin to look at the alcohol industry and its structure, what you find is that these globally operating companies are increasingly taking over more and more of the alcohol market, particularly in beer and spirits. Uh, and, the, and that leaves the alcohol industry looking very, very like the tobacco industry with a small number of c companies dominating what happens. So to the question posed in my title, can brief interventions take on this entity and win? Well, I don't believe that's a question worth taking seriously uh, for very long. I don't think it's possible to imagine that conversations with individuals about their own drinking will be sufficient to take on alcohol marketing. And to be fair to the brief interventions movement, you know, in which I've grown up and worked in for more than 20 years, it has never been the task of brief interventions to do anything more than to identify and help heavy drinkers avoid or manage problems at an early stage. And what's happened in the last 30 to 40 years is that industry marketing and other aspects of industry conduct have made the task of controlling one's drinking more problematic. So alcohol industry marketing undermines autonomy and interferes with people making free decisions about their own, uh, about their own lives. And I'm going to suggest that brief inter interventions in the future must take on this as a challenge and also in so doing deal better with ideas about problems. So this talk is an elaboration of some ideas that were previously presented and you can check out that paper. Uh, and in that I'd suggested that wider, widespread experiences of alcohol problems from the relatively trivial to those that are of a more serious nature are challenging to discuss. Our culture does not support honest conversations about our own drinking, particularly so the more one drinks, which is obviously a big problem for brief interventions. And stepping back, um, you know, the idea of a brief intervention is a conversation of, about alcohol, and that permits wide uh, possibilities for content. And we, we live at a time in which there are all sorts of interesting and very important alcohol policy developments which may be worth talking about in alcohol conversations. So brief interventions was part of the SAFER initiative. Um, it was also um, included within the plans that WHO have been developing since 2020 to accelerate action. All the trends at a global direction are heading in the wrong, in, at a global level are heading in the wrong direction. And the World Health Assembly has agreed just this year to do something about that by 2030. So we could talk about that. And I'm going to su suggest that brief interventions dislocated from those alcohol policy develop developments are not worth pursuing, especially as we know that political science shows that keeping politics quiet are precisely the conditions that allow corporate actors to, to secure the preferred policy outcomes. So what we should do is talk about alcohol and the politics of alcohol and the alcohol industry more and more to increase the salience and the coverage and the profile of alcohol and alcohol policy issues and that in doing so, that can make further policy change more likely. So we recently published this paper, which is a summary of five years of research on the alcohol industry, which investigates involvements in policy, CSR and science. And I'd suggest that one of the reasons why the policy developments have been able to be secured in recent times is not only is the evidence based on price availability and marketing more persuasive, but also because we know more about the alcohol industry. And we use the analogy in the title of this paper that the alcohol, po alcohol industry's policy arguments amount to the em emperor having no clothes. These are, like a these are public relations sham that have existed for decades and decades and prevented uh, developments in alcohol policy that would save people's lives across the world. So what does or what could this new paradigm on brief interventions look like? Well, first of all, as I've already suggested, it needs to escape from only thinking about brief interventions as operating at the individual level. So the new goals of, in, of brief interventions could be to change the public conversation on alcohol and related problems. And if they're the goals, you know, if the aims are revised, that implies a need to develop new content. 
And one could think about new content as ways of providing resources to help people to think about alcohol more broadly. So that would include to help people to think about their own drinking, but also to engage with attractive resources that help them to think about the place of alcohol, not only within their own lives, but also those around them and in society more broadly. So brief intervention co content could become topics for conversations as well as links for sharing. And he here's some examples. So this is what Carlsberg say about special brew. So this is a beer which is, which is not sold in Denmark, but is sold in Britain. And it has a backstory and Carlsberg suggests it's a stronger lager with cognac flavors among its tasting notes. So those of you from Britain will know this as the market leader in very strong beers, particularly favored by homeless people who I doubt spend much time appreciating the cognac uh, flavors in the tasting notes. And these people do not appear in the marketing for this product, strangely enough. And it is not difficult to find many, it is not difficult to find ways of addressing the conduct of the industry in ways which use humor. And maybe we should use humor a bit more in the interventions that we de develop and use scientific methods to study whether that makes any difference or not. There are also other kinds of content within the research literature and that are being disseminated uh, within wider, wider society that could be repurposed as brief interventions. So here's an example on pinkwashing. This is uh, where alcohol companies hijack International Women's Day and associate uh, themselves with ideas of feminism and women's liberation more broadly. Uh, so people could talk about that. Then my final example is this one. Um, two examples within it. Um, and this is a, a legal case that happened in Britain in a, a few years ago that changed the law on the circumstances in which data from mobile phones could be used in criminal court proceedings. Uh, so this man is called Alex Hepburn. He and his flatmate were involved in a bizarre game. From his WhatsApp account, this is a message which he sent to his flatmate. Always been me dragging the birds back, you raping them. Oi, last night was my 60th. Get them blind, then back to mine. Pretty sick, eh? And here's Reynard Sanaga. Reynard is the most prolific serial rapist in British criminal history. He was convicted of 136 rapes between uh, 2015 and 17. The true number of his victims are, is unknown. Uh, his practice was to prey on men who were drunk as they were leaving bars and clubs. He often used GHB, but not always. The common denominator in all of these rapes was alcohol. And alcohol, I'd suggest, is very much underplayed as a date rape drug. I think this is a, you know, these examples suggest that alcohol is a weapon of violence. All forms of violence are in part caused by alcohol. And maybe in public health, we should do much more about that. And making more assertive brief intervention contents might be one way of doing that. I'd suggest also we need to develop content and other uh, currently experienced risks and harms. And developing this kind of material can challenge industry framing about uh, indivi individual responsibility and about the nature of problems to self and harm to others. So just beginning to wrap up now, uh, I'm suggesting that we need to develop both digital and talk content libraries for a brief interventions 2.0 that sets the goal for itself as to counter alcohol marketing. In so doing, I think we need to develop discourses on alcohol problems and communicate those in very clear ways to the general public. I think in thinking about interventions, we need to get beyond moralization and paternalism and be ready to engage with whatever people want to talk about in relation to alcohol and not just the self-regulation of their own behavior. And to do that, we need to reorientate existing brief intervention programs, whether they be in-person or digital programs, to have much broader horizons. So the final slide. The development of brief interventions 2.0 may assist securing more ev evidence-informed alcohol policies. And it probably already has done. You know, perhaps 
the reason we have the developments that we do at WHO level today are because of the work that brief interventions have done in changing the conversation on alcohol. And I'm, I'm going to suggest that it could be considered an essential component of comprehensive strategies on alcohol, as they are today in Scotland and in Ireland. Uh, I suggest we need to become much more ambitious by thinking in a population context about how conversations about alcohol can complement other alcohol policy measures. And finally, to the, the question that was posed in the title, I don't think brief interventions 2.0 can win, can take on and beat the alcohol industry by itself, but I'm pretty confident that brief interventions can be on the winning team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for that excellent presentation. Um, do we have any questions? One over here. Me? Oh, marvellous. Um, thanks for an amazing talk. It's a constant source of frustration. I'm a mother, and it's steeped in the sort of gin mummy craze. My question is um, about something quite hopeful that's been happening on social media, which is the evolution of sober curious social networks, particularly amongst young people. And I guess what I was wondering about is how these could be harnessed um, in service of um, a reframing of sobriety as something desirable and cool. Okay, so, so my perspective is relatively straightforward. I, I think the need is to proliferate all forms of attention to alcohol uh, in all media. So whether it's in social media, in conversations you have with friends, neighbors, even strangers, the more talk there is about alcohol within the general population, the more ideas shift and neoliberal framing of responsibility for problems disappears and the more it becomes possible for politicians to ta start talking about alcohol and for policies to change. So the more the better is my orientation. Um. So there's a, <coughs> I think you were first at the back yeah. there. Yeah, hello. Um, so the, the phrase manipulation of dose is, is new to me um, and I'm really intrigued by it. And uh, I was thinking about um, grocery shopping with my, with my six-year-old and um, how she was drawn to particular cereals. Um, she really wanted to get these cereals, not our usual cereal. And I, I said to her, you know, well, those boxes are designed to make you want them and they're put at your level to, you know, catch your eye. And she did not like this idea that, that she was being manipulated. And, um, and I'm imagining conversations, future conversations with patients using this phrase and talking about um, uh, spears. That was also a new, a new thing to me, but we have a proliferation of hard drinks, hard ciders, hard teas. Um, why, why does tea need to be hard? But anyway, um, are you aware of any research around like um, is, is there any research on how people feel about that kind of manipulation, that kind of um, industry manipulation? Thank you. Apologies, I can't see where in the room you are, so uh, I may be looking in completely the wrong direction. Uh, but there are a number of things that could be said about that. Um, one is that um, you know the, the idea of manipulation of doses specific to drugs, and I think it has a particular potency uh, in that context. The idea that drawing attention to industry behavior and exposing manipulation and that being a powerful instrument of prevention. Yeah, so that idea has been explored before in other areas. So in tobacco control, uh, programs have been developed which show, which basically tell the story to children of what the tobacco industry do and have done and use that as a way of persuading against the uptake of cigarettes. Uh, similarly, uh, obviously in relation to climate change, there's a lot of skepticism uh, within society about the conduct, quite rightly, of fossil fuel uh, industries and the ways in which they interfere with the development of public policy. 
Um, now, I'm not sure that similar programs have been developed and studied the, already, but if they haven't been, I imagine it won't be too long before they are. And I think we should do the same, exactly the same for alcohol. Okay, we're, we're going to run out of time shortly, but if you could be very brief sure. in your question and you could be very brief in your reply, that would be much appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Jim McBridge. Uh, did I say it right? So um, this is my question. You talked about the resources and the lobbying power the alcohol industry has uh, at the political level. Here's my question. How do we, people who live on the mainstream world, of course, brief intervention um, research is helpful for us to talk about, to engage. How do we raise awareness in different sectors of the society? Like, for example, in the family systems, at the educational level, religious organizations, societal organizations. So how do we raise awareness? Um, to Thanks. Thanks this? very much. Yeah, quickly. So in one sentence, I think we should do a lot more with what we've got, whether it's in health and education uh, systems, you know, reorientating our approaches on alcohol to put the alcohol industry center stage and its conduct. Thank you. Super. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jim. So I, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Yasmina Burdjevic. Uh, who's a research professor at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health in Oslo, Norway. And she's going to talk to us about what do we learn about recent trends in underage drinking, secular tr trends, shifts, and relations to other substance use. Thank you. Thank you. It's a mouthful, I know. Um, I know also that we're running out of time, so before I start, I would like uh, to um, declare no conf conflict of interest and to thank all of my colleagues at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, uh, my PIs and co-PIs, and the studies from which I will be presenting some results, and uh, most importantly, adolescents who participated in these studies and provided us with these data. Uh, so I'm going to slightly switch gears and talking about uh, adolescent drinking uh, trends, uh, both uh, secular and developmental, uh, and how they relate uh, and what they might mean in relationship to other substance use, cannabis in particular. So uh, maybe there's some good news uh, if we put uh, these things into perspective from previous conversations and presentations. Uh, in fact, adolescent uh, drinking is declining. It is declining in North America, in uh, Europe, uh, and this decline has been steady. This is the case also in the Nordic region where I'm coming from, uh, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Adolescents are drinking less, and good news, drinking um, less when it comes to hazardous drinking patterns like heavy episodic drinking. So these trends have made uh, other colleagues ask this very straightforward question. Are we actually seeing denormalization of drinking and a normalization of non-drinking in general, but also among youth in particular? And the answer is yes. They're arguing that evidence is very compelling and that in fact, alcohol and drinking is entering this sort of denormalized space and moving away from behavior that we consider normative and acceptable. But I'm going to ask additional question. Is this all? Is this the entire story? Are these alcohol-related trends among youth accompanied by another trend specifically are we currently witnessing not only denormalization of drinking, but also normalization of cannabis use among adolescents? And I'm going to present some evidence from Norway and try to address this question. Um, there will be multiple studies. I will go through all of the sources. I will present some kind of gruesome tables. Bear with me. Uh, they, they look worse than they really are. Uh, and in the end, I would like to conclude my remarks by this question, why should we care? Why should we care about these trends and developments? So quickly, these are the three key data sources, three studies that I'm going to <coughs> use to demonstrate the evidence of these shifts and changes in adolescents' understanding of alcohol, 
and cannabis. So first of all, we have ASPAD, which is European School Survey Project on Alcohol and Other Drugs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. This is a repeated cross-sectional survey administered in multiple European countries, including Norway, every four years. So the last ESPAD year we have is 2019. We have, so, and these data are very useful because these are national representative samples and they are capturing secular change, right? So we have 16 year olds in 2007, in 2011, in 2015, 19. Uh, 16 year olds in Norway go to grade 10 in middle school, so they will uh, enter high school the year after. Uh, and then we can see what 16 year old looks like in these uh, years, in these assessments four years apart. Right. Now we have a study, uh, My Life, it's called Monitoring Young Lifestyles, My Life in Short, that we collected annual data from 2017 to 22 and we utilized accelerated longitudinal design. And what does this mean? It means that we had followed multiple cohorts, grade eight, nine, and 10 in middle school, and assessed the same students for five years repeatedly, okay? So I will show you some results. There will be three lines. There are these cohorts, those kids who were grade eight, 13, 14 years old at baseline assessment, grade nine, 14 to 15 year olds at baseline assessment, and grade 10. 15 to 16 at baseline, and they are five years older at final assessment in 21. Um, let me just note that years 20 and 21 were obviously no news, uh, COVID years. Norway was greatly affected by these circumstances, was the first country to implement a nationwide lockdown, including full closure of all educational institutions for several months. Um, stringent restrictions of movement and travel gatherings, um, encouragement of work from home, in short, um, everyday experiences of Norwegian adolescents were greatly affected during that time. Uh, and finally, we have Cannabis 21, uh, which is not a longitudinal survey, um, but it is a cross-sectional mixed meta-study. So we have among um, 3,500 of students or who have completed the surveys, interviewed about 38 of them, and we will show some evidence from what they told us. Uh, all of these studies are capturing nationally representative samples, uh, save for the My Life, which is a nationwide and very close to representative, but it wasn't really designed to be a representative. So, um, what are the secular and developmental trends in adolescent and alcohol? Uh, cannabis related behaviors that I'm going to talk about. Well, first we're gonna touch upon some attitudes, political and general attitudes towards alcohol and cannabis. Some risk perceptions, how harmful it is to engage in these behaviors or use these substances. And use expectancies. What do we expect to get out of drinking or cannabis use? So using the data from these three projects, I'm going to paint a very broad sort of strokes picture of secular trends across repeated surveys and developmental trends. What do these behaviors and opinions, attitudes, expectancies, perceptions look like while children are developing from middle school to uh, throughout high school? Uh, but before I start, let me see why, what does, let me quickly describe situation in Norway. Well, Norway is an interesting case, not because I live and work there, but because it actually, uh, here's Norway, is uh, characterized by a very uh, unique pattern of alcohol and cannabis use among youth. So uh, we can see these are the ESPAD data. The dark green line is actual um, lowest frequency of uh, alcohol use during past months. So Norwegian youth drink on average four times per month or less. And we share this drinking pattern with our Nordic and Baltic neighbors. However, when due when they do drink, Norwegian adolescents drink quite a bit. So this dark red uh, color signifies, in essence, heavy episodic drinking. They consume quite a bit of alcohol and one, four times a month, that's once a week, quite a bit of drinking. This is a pattern of excessive drinking during weekends. Uh, the story about cannabis use in Norway is quite different. 
Norway consistently scores very low on all measures of incidence and prevalence of cannabis use among youth and also in general population. So here we see this light green line um, signifies that you know under 6% of Norwegian adolescents, those are 16 year olds in grade 10, um, reported having used cannabis during past month. However, in 21, Norway has considered decriminalizing cannabis together with other illicit substances. That legislation uh, proposition didn't pass, so, but nevertheless, it signifies some movements and obviously children are aware of this, uh, or at least some of them are. So this picture paints a very um, unique case study that Norway represents, very high um, cultural tolerance and acceptance of alcohol use, not only alcohol use in general, but actually hazardous alcohol use, kind of heavy drinking on weekends, and uh, cultural, mm, shall I say, lack of interest in cannabis, traditionally speaking. But has this been changing? So let's see. Uh, so we are seeing some changes in political and general attitudes. So here I'm going to present some results from the My Life project uh, and show now the proportions of students who either somewhat or entirely agree with statesmen that alcohol should not be consumed by those younger than 18, which is a legal age limit in Norway. You cannot buy alcohol uh, if you're younger than 18 or hard liquor if you're younger than 20. And then cannabis should remain illegal in Norway. So don't look at the numbers itself. So we can see in 2017, when kids were in, high, in uh, middle school, uh, agreement that, you know, with a statement that alcohol should not be consumed by those underage uh, was very high. And then it's dropping gradually and quite precipitously to sort of 30, 40% agreeing with this statement once they're in high school or about to graduate high school in 2021. Um, cannabis should not uh, remain illegal don't pay attention to trends, look very similar. High agreement in middle school, some cohort differential initially, but that gap closes, uh, the older adolescents get, and it's almost imperceptible in 21. But the message here is that um, prohibition attitudes, shall we say, agreements that alcohol or cannabis should be restricted um, these are not exactly the same questions. They are comparable, right? Capturing attitudes, broadly speaking, look very similar. So we're thinking about 40 to 30% only agree with these statements. In essence, alcohol and cannabis are very comparable. We see this from our qualitative interviews as well, where our children, in adolescents, high school students, um, interviewed as part of Cannabis 21 project literally tell us they're the same thing. So cannabis and alcohol are regarded at the same level. Or even more explicitly, uh, you might as well use cannabis to drink alcohol. I don't see any differences between smoking a joint and having a beer, it's kind of the same thing, says Lisa. Okay, so how about risk perception? So I'm going to go very quickly through a lot of tables, again, very, straightforward message here. Um, we have examined risk perceptions of various alcohol and cannabis use nodes using SPA data. So these are secular trends. Uh, what did adolescents who were 16 years old in 2007 versus those in 2011 and 2015 think about cannabis and alcohol? How did they perceive their harmfulness? So this is a quite a gruesome table, um, but let me just note that uh, in accordance to um, other research presented initially, we see that alcohol use, general alcohol use, as well as intoxication is steadily declining. So there are like these little arrows at the um, end. You don't need to see the numbers, but for example, in 2007, 77% of Norwegian 16 year olds had consumed alcohol at least once during lifetime, and that has gone down to 50, 56, 57% in 2015. Uh, these behaviors are accompanied by shifting attitudes. Um, perceived harmfulness of consuming a couple drinks every day, uh, four or five drinks every day remains steadily high, but do remember this is not the way Norwegian youth drink. They consumed 
uh, you know, five, six, seven, eight beers every weekend, Friday night. That pattern of consumption, which is actually culturally relevant, uh, is going down, or actually increasing in perceived harmfulness, right? So uh, in 2007, 73% of adolescents saw that consumption pattern as harmful, but that has increased to nearly 86% in 2015. Cannabis perceptions are the opposite. So uh, cannabis use actually has remained steadily low during this period, um, but perceptions of harmfulness have gone down. So for example, using cannabis regularly in 2007, 95% of Norwegian youth thought this was harmful. It went down to 90.4%, not a huge shift, but a significant one nevertheless. Let me just add, the reason I actually showed this table is to just plug in the numbers for 2019, the last year of SPA data, we see the continuing exit of alcohol from this normative space. So um, whereas, for example, 57, 58% of Norwegian adolescents had drunk in 2015, that went down to 53%. Risk perceptions have increased for the relevant drinking pattern. Uh, 86% in 2015 thought this was harmful and risky. It went up to 87.4%. Uh, Cannabis, again, the reverse. Uh, actually, we are seeing the flip in cannabis use from 7% in 2015 to 8.7% in 2019. Uh, but the risk perceptions of harms associated with regular cannabis use went down, again, additionally, 4 or 5 percentage points from 90.4% in uh, 2015 to 86.1%. Okay. So these are secular shifts and changes. What about developmental shift? What happens to youth when they age, essentially? Um, so we, I flipped it to see sort of um, normativeness uh, and acceptance of cannabis. So we are now showing a proportion of uh, respondents who perceived no or low risk from either getting drunk every weekend or smoking pot every weekend and getting drunk is the way Norwegian will drink. So clearly there was some increase gradually as they get older, you would see this, these behaviors as less risky, but still about 40% um, perceives no risk. The rest, 60 some percent, assigns it at least some risk. But the most important thing here that I want to show is that um, perception is of no risk from uh, cannabis is following the same pattern. So about 30 or so percent of Norwegian youth in 2019, those are 17, 18, 19 year olds, a couple years older, see no, no great harm in this. Okay, so again, very similarly perceived. Um, just a quick side note, no risk from just trying cannabis is very similar. Um, about 75% uh, of you would perceive no risk from just trying. Uh, and finally, use expectancies. What do we expect from these behaviors, from drinking and smoking, uh, from smoking cannabis at least? Um, I'm going to focus on one specific expectation, which is tension reduction. Uh, do we expect, or do Norwegian youth expect, uh, these substances to help them cope with negative emotions, negative experiences? So these are the things like, do you believe cannabis or you know, drinking would uh, make you feel better if you uh, had a bad day or something like that? So I'm going to show again some data from my life. Uh, incredible increase in positive expectancies and endorsement of, yes, I expect alcohol use to help me manage my uh, negative moods. Um, but uh, please note that 20 and 21 uh, years were again marked by COVID and this is where we are seeing uh, this increase and marked catch up um, by the youngest cohort, which you know was quite low below in uh, 2017. 
expectancies of mood management and tension reduction from cannabis follow similar pattern, but not as sharp. So we are not clear if this is the same. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit more detail in the COVID because that is also a shift, this exogenous shock, right, might have uh, changed with the perceptions. And we have examined this very specifically, very quickly, tension reduction. When we compared kids who were grade 11, started high school during COVID with those who started high school in the years before COVID, we see that the COVID cohort, right, those who were 16 in, 20, um, in the fall of 2020, uh, had greater tension reduction expectancies than their pre-COVID peers of the same age, same demographic profile. Uh, but social facilitation expectancies haven't changed. Those are the things. When I drink, you know, I have better time at parties. That remained the same. So there was something about this experience with COVID that has put additional stress and marked the shift in expectancies. Uh, importantly, this shift was observed not only among drinkers, but non-drinkers as well. Even those youth who did not drink themselves said, yes, alcohol helps you manage uh, bad mood and stress. Perhaps they had observed their parents or other uh, older peers, siblings, using alcohol excessively during uh, the COVID period. Um, and I will say that uh, alcohol sales skyrocketed during the lockdown. So summary, what did we learn? Um, so alcohol and cannabis, at least in Norway, look uh, increasingly similar when it comes to attitudes, risk perceptions, and expectations among Norwegian adolescents. Um, but they seem to be entering this normative space from the opposite directions, right? So alcohol appears to be moving away from, while cannabis is moving towards a legitimate and normative behavior. Why does this matter? Why should we care? Um, well, I believe that the Norwegian case provides strong evidence for these global phenomena. So if we see these shifts in a place like Norway, characterized by high cultural expectation of drinking and high expectance of, um, acceptance of drinking, uh, low acceptance or um, interest in cannabis, then perhaps we will see these, um, then perhaps it tells us that we are actually observing something real. Right? Th th this is happening, right? This is not to say that, you know, this is the same pattern to be observed in other countries, um, and especially those with liberalized cannabis policies might have moved along this process and path at a faster or greater rate. Um, so I also believe that these trends underscore the need for food further examination, not only at the population level, because everything I've shown, so we're groups of people, population, right? But at the group and individual level, because those lines increasing and decreasing do not really tell us anything, what do I as an individual uh, do? It is possible that individuals moving away from cannabis and to, uh, away from <laughs> alcohol and towards cannabis are replacing alcohol with cannabis. And that's why we're seeing these shifts, decrease in alcohol, increase in cannabis. But that might not necessarily be the case. It is possible that those alcohol remainders, if you will, are actually embracing cannabis uh, and complementing their alcohol with cannabis. And these are not mutually exclusive categories. And I was quite pleased to see multiple presentations during this um, uh, conference addressing this particular issue. Whatever the case might be, I think we're seeing the emergence of novel use patterns and novel, novel profiles of alcohol and cannabis use among adolescents. So uh, I'm going to conclude with the shifts in adolescents' understanding and use of alcohol cannot be understood in isolation. Uh, we also need to consider co-occurring shifts in the understanding and use of cannabis. And uh, that is all I have for today. I think I'm right on time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmina. Um, do we have anything, so <laughs> Do we have any uh, any questions? Yes. Well, thank you very much for your um, very interesting presentation. I actually have got a question to you, but maybe also the other panelists would like to comment. Um, I was actually wondering, just uh, maybe looking at ourselves, um, with our conference, we had 
two evenings where we had um, free alcohol, actually. And I was actually wondering what we think about that, knowing that um, the cost of alcohol, well, if it goes up, we tend to drink less. So you're saying young people in North Norway are nowadays seeing alcohol as um, yeah, maybe more risky than yeah, maybe my generation. So I would like, yeah, your comments on that. Okay, I, I, I'm not quite sure what you said that you asked me, but there are... Um, I was wondering if, like maybe everyone, what we think about this, like we think just about like our looking at ourselves from all the research that you all three have presented, like just as well, a future thought. Yeah, um, I, can, I can say this, I, I struggled a little bit how to structure this presentation and whether to include uh, some popular images, for example, because there's quite a bit of content, especially on the internet, aimed at young people, not as a product placement, not as a campaign necessarily strategy, you know, um, but memes. Things like alcohol drinking, and then there is a person vomiting and raping um, and being violent, getting arrested, and, you know, cannabis. Um, hugging their family and girlfriend, just, uh, relaxing in front of TV, right? So uh, yes, this is not, yet one is illegal, one is legal, right? So um, th there are shifts, I think they're real. Um, I don't know what, what to think about it. I, need, I think we need to pay attention to these shifts. We need to understand them, yeah. what they mean, uh, what is underneath them. Um, to tie back to the previous uh, presentation, I'm not sure if you know brief interventions can take on the alcohol industry and win, but the cannabis industry just might. So the way things are going, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. So the question was, how do we feel about free alcohol at the Lisbon conference, was it? Uh. <laughs> I think it's always good to reflect on this, uh, whether our own um, customs and habits are uh, adequate, but uh, the most important thing is to not to push alcohol on anyone, to have um, good alternatives. Great question. Um, I think it would be hypocritical to promote the merits of honest conversations about alcohol within society without having honest conversations amongst ourselves about our own drinking. So I had an amount of alcohol last night that involves a level of risk, and I'd be happy to talk about that more with anybody who wants to talk about it. <laughs> see, well, let, let, you can yeah. see Jim afterwards. Yeah. About yeah. That. Did you want to? Uh, I just wanted to add, actually, I, I live and work in Norway, but I am not Norwegian. I had moved to Norway, and I was floored when, uh, after a talk like this, a presenter was given a bottle of wine as a gift. Uh, that would have not happened in the United States, where I came from, where certainly would not be tolerated, yet was acceptable there. So yeah, something to think about. Um, but in terms of normalization, I do not drink, I did not drink, and maybe I feel more, uh, more okay about this without people asking me, why are you not drinking, are you pregnant, are you, you know, things like that. So yes, the normalization of drinking, normalization of non-drinking, I think is actually a real thing and not a bad one either, so. Thank you very much. I, I can assure everybody no, no free wine will be given to go. the speakers Not anymore. <laughs> after this morning. Uh, but can I just thank all three speakers uh, who have given us three excellent, very diverse presentations today uh, about alcohol. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>